Okay, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another book club for the R for DS cohort nine. I hope you all had a wonderful new year. Um, my name is Ken, and today I'll be going over chapter seventeen of the R for DS book. So in this chapter, we're going to be learning a couple of things. We're going to learn about creating date and date time objects, which essentially involves how to work with dates, especially from different types of formats like posted X or date objects and so on and so forth. We'll also talk about working with date time components and figure out how do you get specific parts of the date for your own purposes, whether you want to round them or modify different parts of a date. And then we'll also talk about how to do some math on durations or periods of time, all that, which involves measuring in seconds or even periods to measure human units like weeks and months and intervals to to basically look at time spans with a, a start time and an end time. And then we'll also talk about how to deal with different time zones and R. So with that said, let's start off by moving forward with this chapter. So one of the things that you should know when it comes to working with dates is that um, the package, there's a package in R that allows you to work with dates. And this package is the Luberdate package, this package right here. So if you see in my R studio, I'm highlighting this Luberdate package, which you can load using the library and then ggplyr and so on. And when it comes to dates, um, there are some functions that you can use in order to essentially get dates. So some good functions that you can try out are today and now. So if I run this command today, it will tell you the current date of today, which in this case, it's January 7 in 2024. And now there's also other things that you can do as well in that you can also get the date as well as the exact time right now. Now, I will say though that um, that the, the that when you run this code on your computer, it's gonna change depending on your time zone. So if I were to type this code, this function now and run that, I will get this date except with this timestamp at 17, 10, 11, which essentially is 5, 10. Um, Pacific Standard Time where I live because I'm in the West Coast of the United States. So these are just two functions that you can use to get dates, especially for the date right now. And and one of the so these are just some of the neat things that you can use with the Luberdate package. And additionally, you can also make dates from strings. So let's say you have a data set where the data is stored as a bunch of strings where dates that are in this format, for example. There are functions which you can use to make these strings into dates. So for example, um, if your date is in this format where the year comes first and then the month and then the date, the day, you can use the, the appropriate function to essentially turn this into a date object. So in this case, we have YMD, which basically means is a way to convert strings into dates, given that the year comes first, the month comes next, and then the day comes after, which is why it's called YMD, year, month, date, which essentially specifies the order of which all these components of the dates are arranged. So, and if you run that, it will return this, but it's a date object. So you can check to make sure that it's a date object. So let me... Yeah, it's a date object. So it will take the string and turn that into a date object, which is useful so that way it knows how to do calculations with it and do some math with it appropriately. Now, suppose that you, what if you had um, a date that's in a different format? Let's say, let's say it's instead of this format, what if the date is like, let's say, the month comes first, the day, and then the year. Well, don't, well, the same applies. You just type the appropriate function. So you type MDY, 
basically the order in which the dates are. And there usually is a function that allows you to parse the date into a date object. Got it. And there's tons of this like that. So depending on the date format, you can find a pre-existing function to that, that takes it in this format and then type in the string and then use this function here, mdy, which is month, date, and year, day and year, which is what this date is in this format. And then you run it, you will, it will essentially, it will essentially parse it right here into the appropriate format. Now you can see here that they all put it in this format here, where it's the year and the month and the day, which is a very consistent format that it uses just for uniformity purposes. But later on, I will show you that there's ways that you can, I, th I think you can kind of parse it in different ways. All right, moving forward. So moving forward, just as a note, uh, when you're doing any kind of date parsing, you have to make sure that it's in the right format. So for example, um, YMD, so the year and the month and the day comes after, comes in that order. If you give a date that it's not in that order, let's say I put December 12, 2007, where the month comes first instead of the year, if you run it, you will get an error because it doesn't recognize that format. It's not in the format that you need to put it in so it can read it. Okay, let me... Right, okay. And in addition to dates, you can also do it in date time format where it's the same as before. You have the, the, the year, month, and date, YMD, and so on. But you also have an HMS, which stands for hour, minute, and second. So this is useful if you want to say, in effect, you want to be able to add a timestamp in addition to the date as well. I'm going to show you kind of how to get that. So remember earlier that I showed you the now function, which shows you the, um, the current date and the time, depending on where you where you are, where you live, your time zone. Now let's convert this into a, a date time object. So you run the appropriate method. So what you do is you do YMD, which stands for the format, and then you type the appropriate one. So you can see here when you type YMD and then you do that, the underscore, you get all these different methods. So YMDH, which basically makes date objects out of timestamps where you just have the hour and there's one for hour in the minute and then the hour in the second. So in this case, we're just going to get hour, minute, and second. And then you type now and then run this chunk. You now have a, a timestamp and a date that's parsed into a date object right here. Now you see here it's in UTC, which is by default is the default time time zone of the um, of R when it comes to parsing certain dates. But later on, I'll show you how you can change the time the, um, the time zone. But for now, just know that you can convert um, date times into date time objects, especially if they're strings. All right, before I move forward, um, any questions? No questions. Okay. All right, so moving up. Um, in addition to turning strings into dates, you can also make dates as well. So you can use the make date function to set the to make up make dates, where you can set the year, the month, and the day. So for, in this example, I I type out make underscore date, which is this function that allows you to make dates, and you can specify the year and then the month and the day, and you can also add extra, and then and this when you run this it will give you just the date itself. However, if you want to have the date and the time, you can do the same thing here where you have make date time and then you specify the year, the month and the day. And then you also add in the hour, minute and seconds here. So if you run it, you can make a date time by hand. Okay, 
And then moving on, you can also make dates out of columns containing components of it. So for instance, in the flights data set, which is in the, the package right here, NYC flights, it comes with a data set called flights, which is essentially a data set that contains all the, the data for the different flights, such as what time is it departing, what year, what month, what day are these flights. And you can see here in this snapshot of this data set that the year, the month, and the day, and the times, they are all in separate columns. And then the question becomes, well, how do you, how can you use all these columns and combine them to make one timestamp? One of the ways you can do it is you can make a function called make underscore date time, where you can use the make date time function, which if you remember, allows you to manually create date time objects where you can set the year, the month, the day, and then hours, minute, and seconds. So you can use that and then specify the columns where the, the, the dates, the components of the date are. So year, because the year is in here, month, and then day. And now to get, um, don't, if you recall the hours and the minutes, uh, we do a little bit of math on these times in order to get that. Because you have to remember that these times right here, so this 517 is actually supposed to read 517, the, 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 the time. However, because it hasn't been formatted yet, it's now treated as an integer, which is something we don't want. And so one of the ways we can get the hour part of the time, this five right here, is by dividing it by 100. And this right here is integer division, meaning that when you, when you divide a number by another number, you get the integer and no decimal. Because if you did 517 divided by 100, you get 5.17. But we don't want this 17, which doesn't make any sense. So we just want this integer here. So if you just don't want the decimal, what you can do is you do this integer division where you do a percent and then the, the slash and then the percent and then by 100, it will only return the integer, which is five. So that's another trick that you can use to get the, the um, as an integer. So that's what we can use to get this five right here. Now for the minute part of the time, like right here, you can get it from here by using essentially um, mod, which is sort of like a form of division where you return the remainder. Because if you divide 517 by 100 and you, you subtract 500 from that, you get a remainder, which is 17. So it will return the remainder of the division when you divide these two numbers. So, so it won't take evaluate to a decimal, but it will only get that remainder. So if you do that, it will give you, which is these two percent signs, which is the mod func mod operator. It will get you seventeen, and we can check that. So five seventeen mod a hundred, it will get you back seventeen. So it's a pretty useful thing that you can use a trick that you can make. And right now I have it as a function, so that way I don't have to keep doing it for every single. I have to type this thing out when I'm going through the, 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 the tibble. So you run that. And yeah, so th that's just an example of what you can do to parse your dates and times. And you can run this on your flights data set in order to do that. So let's, we can try that out here. So flights. And then you can do mutate. You can do, you can you can type it as time stamp equals make make date time, which is the name of the function. And then you specify where the year, the month, the day, and then or let's yeah deep. Depart timestamp. And let's say 
you want to get the depart time for right here and make that into a timestamp with the date. So you can specify depth time. Oh, thank oh, I you. I just put it, yeah, it's not, yeah, never mind. Okay. And so if you run this, you should get a column that basically has a timestamp here. And so here, you now have some timestamps here that correspond to these different times. So it's a pretty neat thing, especially if you're trying to make a date timestamp out of a bunch of different columns. So pretty useful right. tool. Oh, man. Uh, I'm reading it wrong. Never mind. Okay. Okay. Actually, um, go back up here. Go back. Yeah. Um, um, oh no, I was just kind of understanding. Okay, so you have the time hour and then the departure timestamp. Um, I'm not sure what's going on because, like, the departure timestamp. It looks like if you go down, it's only. So you took out the remainder is what happened because it's, yeah, I'm a bit confused because before the, like, I think the first one, the time was like 513, but now it's like, um, or 517. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll have to look at it later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's just a way you can do that. Yeah. But anyway, um, so, and then it's, and then there's also other functions as well where you can convert, as we did earlier, into dates. So you have the as underscore date and then as underscore date time for if you want to make a date or just have a timestamp. So these are two extra functions that you can use, to make it into time. And now as you note here, when we use today and as date time, you notice how there's no timestamp. And that's because today, if I type it out, does not have a timestamp. So by default, it just leaves it blank. So just a heads up if you ever try to use date time on that. I mean, it will still run, but just know that it's not going to give you a timestamp. For sure. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, you can also change the time zone. You can also change the, the time zone in your code where... By de where if by default, it's set to origin, which means that the starting date is 1970 uh, from January 1. Because the way times are stored in most computers is that it's sort of like an ongoing stopwatch since this date. And that's how it kind of uses it to calculate these dates. And be because, of, because of that, um, there's, and just as a heads up, and as I mentioned earlier, you can, as we saw earlier with the previous examples, you can see how um, Luberdate has all these different functions to parse different dates depending on the format or how you arrange the um, um, the components of the date, like the year, the month, and the day. But what if you have a situation where you don't have a function that fits the date format that you have? Well. Thankfully, you have a bunch of options that you can use to do that. So let's say, for example, we have a date that's written in this format, where yet the year comes first, the month, and the day. So if you ever tried to run this in YMD, it's going to throw an error because YMD only recognizes it with you know, when you put it as a hyphen, but not with these slashes. So if you're in a situation where you have a, spe a special date format and you want to parse it as a date, you can use this as date time object to 
specify the format and then have it turn it into a date. So, so what you do is you have this argument X where you specify the date. And then this TZ is the time zone, which if you look up, um, go to Wikipedia here, this will give you a table of, of um, time zone, time zones and their names. Where if you go here, um, you can use these TZ identifiers here as the names for your time zones. And then based on whichever time zone you want, you go back to your R studio and then in, you type it in here exactly as it is. So in this case, I'm setting it to America and Detroit, the time zone for Detroit, for TZ. And then for the format, you here, this is where you specify um, how to how the date is formatted. So the way you type out this format here is you have to use a specific set of code in order to basically tell it where the components of the dates are. So if I were to go here, hold on. If I were to go to this website, which I'm going to post here, link to typing. If, if you go to this link here, it will show you the symbols that you use so that way you can tell R where the parts of the dates are. So in this case here, for example, this percent D stands for day as a number. And then this percent um, B stands for unabbreviated month. And then this is what it looks like. And then this capital Y in the percent is basically the year. And so using this code, you can use this to type out the format of the date. So in this case, we have the year, the month, and the day. And so I put the percent capital Y to tell R, hey, this is where the date is. And then I put a slash to tell it, oh, that in this date format, I, I use slashes. And then percent M to tell where the month is, which in the case is one, which is January. And then percent D, which is the day. And so you specify this format exactly as how it should, so that way it knows where to take parts of the year, the month, and the day. And then you put it in format as an argument, and then you run it, it will give you the date here converted into the appropriate time zone and a date time object. So that's just an option that you have in case like you run into dates that don't fit the format that Luber, Luber date package has convenient functions for converting into date time objects. As an extra note, you can also get the names of all the time zones here by typing this Olson names. And just as a FYI, this list has about 600 names. So it's a pretty big list. So just point that out there. But if you run it, it'll give you a list of all these different time zones here. Oh yeah, it does. Um, it does. I was just providing another link, but thank you for pointing that out, Jeremy. Yeah, it does have actually have that though for sure. Thank you. I was just pointing to another link in case you know people want an explanation for it. But yeah, but this, but yeah, the R for DS books does have that as well. So, in addition to this link, you can also use this to basically figure out the format on how do you tell R where the parts of the date are. Yep. Thank you, Jeremy. Anyway, going back. So here you have all these um, time zone names, and then you pick the one that corresponds to the one that you want to set the date to. So that's just another option as well. Right. All right. Moving on to 17.2. Um, we're going to show you a little bit about how to work with date time components. As when it comes to dates, you can get different time components from the times, especially if you want to look at different parts of the date and then do something with it. And this only works when the date's already been converted to date time objects or posit X CT objects, which is a type of date format. 
and any methods and some of these methods that you can use are the year, month, Y day, M day, weekday, hour, and then minute and second, which are all different components of the daytime that corresponds to the year, the month, the, the, the day in the month, or the day in the year. Like how many days has transpired since the beginning of the year? And then weekday, basically the day of the week, Saturday, Sunday, and so on, and then hour, minute, and second which you can use on these date time objects to get specific parts. So like if you want the year, just the year from the date, you can just run this function on, on um, the date time object and it will return the year. So, however, just as a note, um, if let's say for example, this date, which has tells you the day, the, the month and the year, but does have a timestamp. If you try to run a function like hour on it, and it doesn't have an, the hour component, then it will turn zero. So just as a heads up though, like it'll still run, but it will give zero since there's no hour component here. But if I do something like, let's say year, which it has, you run this, it'll give you the year, 1975. Sure. And you can, and here's just more examples of that. So let's say I type now, which gives you a timestamp and I get the year. It'll get you 2024. And as a note, um, just know that the, for R, it doesn't support dates at z af before at zero CE or and after. So you can only do dates after the year zero. So no 10,000 BC or something like that. So just as a heads up. So other than that, like the year function works pretty well with any standard date like this one. And, and you can also get the month as well. So now when it comes to month, like with any other functions, you have to make sure it isn't in a format that it can read. Because if you run, let's say this example, December 12, you run that, it'll get an error. Because with these functions, like I said earlier, it has to be in a date time object before you can do any of these functions on it. And a way to fix it is just pick the right function to get it. So in this case, we have the month and then the day and the year in that order. So you do MDY, put in parentheses, the, the date, and then you run the month function on it and it'll return the month from that date. So in this case, December, which corresponds to 12. So you get 12 with, since December is the 12th month in the year. Now, this is just a little bit something extra. You can also customize the arguments for month and so on, where there are additional arguments that you can use to um, really customize how it returns the month. Because by default, it just turns the number. 12, which is the 12th month of the year, December. But in, in case you want to have it as a name instead of a number, you can use the, um, the label argument and set it to T to basically say, hey, instead of a number, I want you to give it to me as a name, right? You can set that as well and it will make it into a name. And when you use this argument here, you can also use another argument that works with this called ABBR abbreviation equals T, which basically allows you to set it as either um, an abbreviation or you want the full name of the month. Because by default, it abbreviates it. So if you look at here, it returns December, DEC, which is short for December. If you don't want it abbreviated, you can just set it to false and it'll just give you the full month. So just a neat little trick that you can you can use if you want to get the month in many different ways. And here's another example. Right. Yeah, you see here. And you can see here that with month, it appropriately puts it in order. With January 1st and then December last. You can also get the day as well. So like before, you have to convert it into a date time object and then run the appropriate day. 
So Y day basically means the day of the year as there's 365, 360 days in the year. So if I run this code, December 12th, wait, hold on. Wait. So if I run December 12th, it'll give you the number 346, which tells you how many days is it since the beginning of that year. So for the year 2014, December 12th is basically 346 days into the year since there are 365 or 366 days in that in a year, depending on whether it's a leap year or not. So this tells you basically how many days have passed since the beginning of the year for this particular year, 2014. Now, if you want the, um, the specific day of the month, like this 12 here, you can just type in M day, which will return the corresponding day of the month. So 12, for an example. You can also get the weekday as well where you want to know what day of the week is this. You just run in W day and then your date time object. You run that. It'll give you six, which basically means it's a Friday because Friday is the sixth day of the week. Now, like we, we did earlier with a month, you can also do some extra arguments for the day of the week. So like before, you can ask R to make it to show the name of the day of the week instead of just showing it as a number like we saw earlier where six, it returns six, which stands for Friday. You can ask it to give it the name Friday. So, so you can set label equals to T, which will return the name of the weekday. And then like before, you can ask it to abbreviate or not. So you can have Friday abbreviated where it's just F-R-I or you have the full name Friday. And this week start argument basically allows you to set the, the beginning of the week. So by default, Sunday is considered um, the, the first, basically the, um, the start of the week. Yeah, so you can see here, week start equals seven. Since, by, since the way R stores the weekday of the week, one is equal to Monday and then seven is equal to Sunday. Wait, hold on. Yeah, weeks. We say the week starts. So, but, but yeah, so you can change basically the week starts. So you see how it orders it a little bit differently depending on either. By default, it puts it as Sunday. And then locale basically allows you to get the time zone that you want it to set it as. So this is an optional argument. And by default, it will just give you the current time zone that you're in. So, but this you don't need, but this is just an option if you want to specify a certain time zone. And then you can also get the hour as well, which is pretty straightforward. You just, you just run this code on the timestamp and it will turn the hour. So in this case, it's 17 hours, which is about like five o'clock PM. And then you, it will turn 17. You can do the same for the minute and then for the second, just to get the second right here, provided the timestamp has that. And you can see here that it returns it as a decimal because uh, with the way R stores dates, it's very precise. So it, restore, it stores it as a decimal. Now, now, I bet a question that comes up is, how do you round up dates with anything? And so when it, one of the ways that you can go about it is by using the function round date, where it follows a general rule for rounding. Rounding. So for instance, um, for the function round date, you basically use this function round date to basically first specify the date time that you want to modify and then set the unit that you want to do the rounding on. So in this case, I want to do rounding on the seconds. And then you can also change the week of the, the, the star. So in the, by default, it's seven, which is Sunday. And then if you run this, 
it will round it to, you can see here, this is the original date and it rounded up to 29 because if you looked at this timestamp, it's at 28.58. And we specified the unit seconds, which means when it rounds the time, it rounds it based on this second. And since it's very precise, it's 28.58, it's gonna round it up to 29. And these arguments are the same when you use the other two functions, floor date and ceiling date, which for this case, floor date, it allows you to round up to the lowest, next lowest um, integer num number. So in this case, for this timestamp, if I run this, it'll run it to the lowest um, integer. So in, since I'm rounding it on seconds, it's going to round it down to 13. Now, if I want to round up, I can use ceiling date and then specify the unit I want to round on. So in this case, I used it on seconds and I run it and I get this. So you have the original timestamp and you can see here, it went up to 23 because if you look at the seconds, it started as 59.98, which because we specified seconds, it's gonna round up to 60, which means it's the start of a new minute, which is why you see this 22 goes to a 23 because we're rounding up the ceiling it means you go you round up. And one of the cool things about um, Luberdate package is that you can also modify different parts of the date time. So that way you can ch change it however you like, instead of having to make a new date time object each and every time. And one of the ways you can go about it is by, for instance, as I showed you earlier, you can also set the time zone for this timestamp. So when you use this, like year, month, day, and then hours, minutes, seconds, you run that, it's going to get you the, the timestamp in accordance to the appropriate um, time zone. And when it comes to um, the, the date, there's also a function that you can use that allows you to update the date. So let's say you have this date right here and you wanna modify it based on certain things. Let's say you wanna change the year, the month, and the, 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 the day of the month, and then the hour, and then the minute and the second. So, and the, the start of the week. So one of the ways you can do it is use the up, update um, function where you specify the object, basically your time, and then you can change your time zone, and then the year, the month, and then the month, the day, and then the hour, the minute, the second, the week start. So you can have you can do as much customization as you like with this date. And so you have this original date here. You run that, and it'll give you the new date. So. Now, just as a heads up, um, when you're working with dates, uh, be careful not to use negative numbers when you're doing that. Because while it will still run, it's what's going to happen is that it will give you, it will do some, you could say, subtraction with it. So, for example, let's say you have this date November, and I type negative one for month. And what's going to happen is that it's going to, so the idea is that when it stores months, it stores it as numbers. So one means January, two is February, and so on, all the way to 12. And so you specify a number that's out of range. Um, it's going to cycle to um, <clears throat> month cycle. So let's say, for example, month equals one is January. If you type month equals zero, it's going to go to the month before it, which is December. And then you type month equals negative one, it's going to go to the month before that, which is um, November. So it will still run, but it's going to create an error, a create a, a little bit of a problem where it's subtracted from the year. Because you see here, like I set the year to 2022, and yet it went back to 2021. Well, that's because since you're doing negative numbers, it's going to go back a year just to get the date. 
Because if you do it as a positive, it will just stay within the year. But if you do it as negative, it's going to go back a year. It's kind of stores months as like a cycle. So while this stuff does work, uh, it's probably not a good idea to do that, especially if you're trying to do math or calculations with the date, which I will show you later on, you know, with that. So just as a heads up, like you don't, you don't want to ideally don't want to use update to do some math with the dates. This is only if you want to change the, the months itself. So just as a heads up. And the same thing goes if you type in a positive number that's bigger than the number as possible. So like, for example, day, because months in general, there's usually about 28, 29 to up maximum of 31 days in a month. So if you type a number over it or under it, it's going to add or subtract. It's going to cycle to the next month or the previous month. So if I type December and I type 35 days, which is greater than 31, it's going to go to January 4 because there's only 31 months in December. And if you take the difference, so 35 minus 31, it becomes four. And 30, December 31, four days from December 31 gives you January 4. So while stuff like this can work, it, it's kind of confusing to work with, which is why I recommend if you're trying to do some math with it or trying to change the date, you want to just manually change it to the date that you want. Or as I might show you later on, you can do some calculations with it instead, which is far more better than manually just trying to do all this like math with this update function. All right, so moving on um, to 17.3, you can do a little bit of math with these time spans essentially a period of time between two dates. And it's usually measured in terms of durations, which means that, that it, you basically use these functions here to specify a, basic, a certain period of time and then get it in seconds. And you can do some math with it, add, subtract, divide, or even multiply, depending on the function you're working with. So I'll show you with some examples. So let's say I want to subtract today. So today's date is January 7. And I want to figure out how many days it has been since 1973 on January 12. So if I do some subtraction here, take today's date, subtract it from this year month date object, it will tell me that it's been 18,622 days. So this is pretty useful if you want to know how long it's been since, say, a period of time. Um, the the problem with that is that it it's it returns a string. This is basically a bunch of text. So if you're trying to do math with like that, when you're subtracting two dates, this might not be very useful if you're trying to do some math with it afterwards. But thankfully, the Luberdate package has other ways where you can do some math with it. So you can use the function as.duration to basically convert this here into seconds. So basically take two dates that are daytime objects, subtract them from each other, as an example, and then run the as.duration function on it, which will give you the amount of time that difference between the two. So in this case, it's been this many seconds or this many years, about 51 years since 1973 in January 12th. And this one, you can actually do some math with it. So if I add 10, it's going to update. So you can actually do some math with it. But just remember that it's in seconds. Additionally, there's all, you can also figure out different durations and get it in seconds. So you have this function d seconds, which allows you to get a time object for 15 seconds. So if I run this D seconds 15, it will return 15 S, which is 15 seconds. And then let's say I want to know how many seconds there are in this many minutes. So I can run D minutes. And let's say I type 10, I don't, as I want to figure out how many seconds are there in 10 minutes. And it will return 600 S, which is 600 seconds. 
And let's say I want to know how many seconds are there in this many hours. You do the same thing. You can also, because R is vectorized, you can turn, you can have a whole vector of numbers and then ask it to give you the number of seconds for, for whatever period of time that you're working with. So in this case of hours, we have 12 hours and 24 hours. And you run that, it'll give you the number of seconds per each of this. So for 12 hours, you have this many seconds, 4,300, 200, 43,200. And then for 24 hours, you have 86,400 seconds right here. So these are just options if you want to get how, how long something is for a certain period of time. You can also do this for number of days too. Like let's say you want to know how many seconds it is within this many number of days. So you run something like this, where, and it will give you the appropriate one. So here in this case, I'm asking it to give, to generate a sequence of numbers from zero to five. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and ask it to tell you how many days it's been for let's say zero days, one day, two day, three day, four day, five day. That's option. And the same also applies for weeks and years. So D weeks. So how many seconds are in three weeks? How many seconds in one year? So, and as I said before, you can do some math with it too. So D minutes, I can divide it by 60 and it'll give me 10 seconds. So you can do some math with it or even addition. Now, just know that not all these math operations will work for every single one. So as a rule of thumb, you can always check this list right here in 17.3 which will tell you what you can actually do. So with different types of objects. So you can see here with duration, you can do add and subtract for date and then for date time. And then you can see here, if it's a number, you can do add, subtract and multiply. So, and wherever you see these symbols here, it will tell you for th these different types of objects for dates and times, this is what you can do in terms of calculations. So. It's a lot to cover, but this is a useful reference if you want to know what you can do with calculations. And as I said before, you can always get the seconds and the minutes with the second and the minute function. And then, and as I said before, if, you, if you're running, a, say, a minute function on a date time that doesn't have a minute, it's going to return zero. FYI. And as I said before, you can use mm, you, as I said before, you can use Olson names to get all the time stamp time zones names. For in this section, I'm going to show you how you can um, get dates in different time zones. So let's say I have a date where it's in Detroit, for example, like we saw before. And I want this date to be in a different time zone and it will convert appropriately. So let's say I want to know what's the time given this date, which is 1975 and 1204 in Detroit. I want to know what time is it in Abidjan in Africa. So you can use the with TZ function to set your time the time that you want to change, and then the time zone that it's in. Actually, no. And the time zone that you want it to be in. And then you run this. It will give you the appropriate time in that time zone. So it converted this time from Detroit to this time in Africa. And now suppose that you don't want the time in that time zone. Let's say you just want to change the name of the time zone. Like you don't want to change this time here because you saw earlier that that by changing it from one time zone to another, we changed the time itself. So it's just trying to get the appropriate time. What if you just want to change this name right here, this name of this time zone? You can use the uh, function called force TZ right here to just change the time zone where you specify the date time object you want to change. And then you type T zone out to specify the, the time zone that you want to change it to. So right now it's in America, Detroit, which is EST. And then you run force TZ and then T zone out and then the name of the time zone. 
And it'll give you the same time as we did here, except it's in PST, the time zone that we picked. So those are just some options that you have when it comes to working with date time objects and changing the time zones. And if you're curious about where I got these names from, they're from, um, you can find the list of time zones here in this Olson names function, which if you type it out, it give you a list of all 600 time zones, which is a lot, but it's useful if you want to figure out the exact names because it's very case sensitive for all that. Okay. All right, with that said, um, that is it for this um, book club today. Um, I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, otherwise, um, thank you all for coming and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. So thank you.